Time to back, my friend. Tasty bites. Ah, uh, we are. But I mean, wait, listen. I mean, I mean, I know we're at a different point in longevity than we were a couple of years ago. But do you have to have a team come in and primp you? In between breaks, I mean, Doyle was here washing your table down for you, fixing your hair. We had somebody else putting a little something, something on your nose. No, you didn't. Uh, yeah, we did. No, What's didn't. going on over there? I, had, I got nobody over here. I'm I had on a little spill. island. I had a spill. I don't. I, I was going to use my I sleeve. Was, I was going to use my sleeve. sleeve. Can be used for anything. You know that, right? I mean, we've been doing that since we were three. Um. All right. I'm. Before I get into market stuff, I want to touch on do this tasty bite segment, and then we'll talk more about the markets at uh, mechanical trading. Yeah, um, it's really important, and and people email us all the time, and they say, "I wish you guys would spend more time talking about the markets." And I kind of want to spend less time talking about the markets and more time talking about um, uh, more time more time talking about how to be independent with respect to the markets because. It, it, the markets tell the markets tell a nonstop story. Mm -hmm. The thing with it is, is it it's not how you make money. What you make money from is an appreciation, is a deep understanding and an appreciation of where everybody else spends their time, right? So that you don't have to, right? So that you can either benefit from it or avoid it altogether, yeah. right? You can be one of the herd, and nobody's really ever been able to explain the herd. The herd. The herd is not necessarily doing the same thing that everybody else does. Mm -hmm. To me, the crazy thing is I never even cared that everybody does what everybody else does. To me, the herd is trying to figure out everything like everybody else does. Right. Like the whole world tries to figure out the markets. Uh, you know, um, there was uh, – um, the funniest thing was there was this – I got this email from TD because I'm a customer, just like mm -hmm. everybody else, and they have this day, like an investor day today, you know, it, it's, which means that they have an education day or something. Mm -hmm. And they have Jeremy Siegel's actually speaking. You're kidding me. I swear. I couldn't believe it. I read this. I'm like, there are the biggest bunch of losers speaking. And I'm like, and I love this firm, but I'm just looking at this thing going, oh, my God. Like, they fell. The trap is set. Mm -hmm. Okay? Like, they because they're trying to do the right thing, which I understand. But it's like trying to figure out. Like, you know, listening to the Jerry, Jeremy Siegels of the world, what what's going to happen with what you should do with your money. It's just like you're part of the herd then. Right. What you should be figuring out is w why you're different. So that so that when everybody else is trying to figure out what he can't figure out and is trying to tell you that he Never can figure out. Figure and out, nobody right. has ever been able to figure it out. Okay. What you should be the, on the other side trying to say, how do I take advantage of? Of how do I everybody else this? trying to take, you right. know, of everybody else trying to figure out how do I take advantage of that? That's where that's what differentiates me. Mm -hmm. That's the cool piece. All I right, agree. let's go to and then every firm is is you know every firm's guilty of that, and because that's all they know. Uh -huh. What's going to happen as years and years as, as we go down the road for the next couple of years and years and years is that there'll be a few people, whether that's a hundred thousand people or two hundred thousand people or fifty thousand people, who knows that 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 understand that just. Five ten minutes and something like Tasty Bites is worth four four hundred hours mm -hmm. of trying to break Sitting down in a room like that. Sure, trying to break it down. Agreed. Yeah, there's um, yeah, they have an economy. I mean, the whole the whole deal is like, oh my god, I've heard all these people speak. They say the same damn thing. There's absolutely nothing. It's like can nothing you, useful for the retail. Can investor. you figure out a better way to waste ten hours? Right. You know, can you figure? But that's anywhere. Like like, can you you can watch CNBC or Bloomberg all day? Can you figure out a better way to waste ten hours? I want my hour back that I read Barron's last weekend. <laughs> like I, after all these years, I'm still like, you know, I, I, I still make the mistake every once in a while. I want that hour back. Mm -hmm. Creature of habit. Right. I want that freaking hour back because that was a waste of life. Mm -hmm. And, you um, can't have it back. I know. I know. Sometimes I, like I, yesterday, yesterday, I want the time back. We, and we spent playing golf mm -hmm. and I want the time back. I spent reading Barron's. I want the time back. I listen to economists. I want the time back. You know, I mean, unfortunately we never get it back, but I'd rather waste it on, you know, reruns of family guy. Right. <laughs> At least it's entertaining. Something useful. <laughs> Mechanical trading. Let's throw it up. Um, this is for a lot of new listeners. We're going to take one step backwards before we take two steps forward. Starting next week on Tasty Bites, um, we're going to take a slightly different approach. And starting next week, there will be a there will be a specific takeaway, a major league takeaway every single week. And the takeaway will be something different than you've ever heard before. We're putting it together right now, so it's a change of direction. But to set that up. 
I wanted to go through kind of the mechanics of kind of the small account mentality, the mechanics of the small account of, of the small account process. Mm -hmm. Developing a solid mechanical trade strategy is critical for success in any tri size trading account. The problem with smaller accounts, which is the Tasty Bite account, is that you don't have room. Again, I'll use a horrible baseball analogy. If you're a rookie. Um, or if you're a first or second year player and you're a low draft pick and you make it up to the big leagues and you don't succeed right away, they cannot take the risk to keep you around. Right. You, you don't have the cushion. Same thing here on a small account. If you're a high draft pick and you're making a ton of money and or you're a veteran making a ton of money, you have to be kept around because they can't afford to eat your salary. It's right. it's business. It was a whole too big to fail type thing. That's right? exactly what it is. In in the world of um in the world of trading, it's the same thing. If you have a decent size account, you can skate by on a few mechanical mistakes. It's not good, but you can get by. If you have a small account, you cannot get by with mechanical mistakes. Right. All right. So the most important first no step. Room. The most important first step is to develop a well thought out logic chain. Nobody else would ever suggest that to you as the first step with investing. There's, hey, understand, understand, you know why this market does. Try to do your homework. Figure all this stuff out. That's not what you need at all. What you need is a logic chain. And the logic chain has nothing to do with what is ultimately going to happen with this underlying. It's make sure that the pieces, that all the pieces line up and you can connect all the dots with respect to whatever your assumption is and whatever strategy you're going to apply. Let's go to the next slide. So we create a watch list of 30 to 50 stocks. And even for small accounts, Okay. One of the problems I have with what Case does is I don't like her watch list. She has a very she has a small watch list and she's not really utilizing her watch list. So she's focusing on a couple of different underlines. She needs to be she needs to she needs to really broaden and understand her watch list. So there's 30 or 50 different underlines and she's familiar with that. Rather than watch your PL, watch Which, your watch list. Right. Make sure that everything on your watch list is liquid so you can rely on pricing efficiency. We talked about this yesterday. Pricing efficiency is a huge drag. Remember, average three contracts, three contracts per spread, times that by some commission amount. It's thousands of dollars a year. That's right. Even for a small account, it could be thousands of dollars a year. So be very careful here because liquidity on a small account has a greater percentage effect than it does even on a larger account. Mm -hmm. And by limiting the number... You can become comfortable and familiar with them to aid in your trade assumptions. Liquidity is way more important than almost anything else. You, as long as you kind of understand the different logic steps, you have to have the liquidity. The marketplace. It's the first mechanical thing I always look for. Well, it's even before IV. It's even before anything else. I see yeah, but to understand liquidity. liquidity, you've got to at least have a watch list so you can compare apples to apples. Sure. And you can compare all the underlying. So you need a watch list first. Then you need these ridiculously liquid stocks because, again, if you make 200, I mean, just think about this. Cases, by the end of the year, she's going to have made, you know, 500 different trades. <laughs> okay, 500 probably. All total, of, or at least 500 trades. When you're talking about 500 trades, right, you, you're going to end up with, if you give up a, a dollar on each one, even if you're only trading two lots, that's a thousand dollars. Sure. When you're talking about a twenty five hundred dollar account, that's forty percent of your revenue. It's hey, a huge the numbers number. are humongous. Let's go to the next slide. On your watch list, keep an eye you, on your watch list. You can keep an eye on implied volatility and implied volatility percentile to add in your trade decisions. The two questions are, and, and again, this is what's so important here. Remember, you're talking about a retail public of a few hundred million people, ultimately, or a few hundred million investors. You're talking probably 50 million retail investors. You're probably talking about less than 50,000 that have any idea what implied volatility is. And you're talking about less than a few thousand that or, or less than a few tens of thousands that really understand what implied volatility percentile is. So just be very clear of where the volatility that you're buying or selling or trading is relative to its range. So you can have reasonable expectations about expected move and, and uh, direction. Okay. Price efficiency, whatever you want to call it. Let's go to the next slide. Look at the price to see if there is any mean reversion assumptions that can be made. I wrote something last night, Tony, in the cherry bomb, and I think I may have confused some people because I got some emails on it this morning, but this is very interesting. Go back to cherry bomb for a second. And what I wrote in the first line was, although volatility took a beating yesterday, when reversion to the mean dictates that premium fails, trading. the premium falls, trading is always better. What that means is um, that... 
even though volatility was down yesterday, when reversion to the mean dictates that premium falls, trading is better because we like to sell premium above historical means or historical, historical averages, okay? And so what happens is when volatility falls and your starting point is above the number that you expect it to get down to, it's good. Right. So one of the things that we like to focus on is at least understand which is a reasonable level for expectations. If you're selling volatility, if whatever you're doing, if you're expecting a certain type of move, you're not likely to get that move if you're facing complacency or or capitulation because of a volatility extreme, and you're not likely to get the price advantage if you are situated at a volatility level that you're not going to get paid on. Correct. Okay. And so it's very important to understand that. The, the, those are just reversion assumptions. So when the market moves in a direction that might not be your own, as long as volatility, the direction you want to go in, as long as volatility is contracting, you can still make money. That's on the exactly position. right. You know, remember, you can be shorted below the mean or you can be shorted above the mean. You'll take above the mean. Correct. <laughs> Shorting it below the mean just puts you in, it's much more challenging. Shorting above the it mean makes your position a lot more reliable on the direction of That's the right. So, so that's all I wrote in there today was that, that's a positive thing. Mm -hmm. Are there binary events such as earnings announcements that may come, that may change the strategy we employ? You know, as much as we think we're all over everything, we're not. And we sometimes make, we made a mistake yesterday. We Correct. thought we made an earnings play that was coming out today. It's tomorrow. So it, it's not that easy. Right. It's not that easy to stay active. It's not that easy to do all the stuff that's required, you know, to kind of just always stay in the game. So, so you, you, by just looking at implied volatility, you can tell if there's a binary event. Yep. Let's go next slide. Okay. Next, we look to create our trading assumption. Are we bullish? Are we bearish? Are we neutral? Are we looking for price reversion? I mean, I don't know the answer, except that when things are extremely, what we consider to be oversold, two things happen. Either we get an oversold condition with implied volatility at the 100 percentile, or we get an oversold condition with implied volatility at the you know, at the bottom end, mm -hmm. or we get adverse, we get overbought too, either way. Like yesterday afternoon, I wanted to put a position on in Groupon. Mm -hmm. And I haven't traded Groupon in a while. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to sell the eight. I just looked at Groupon. Stock was trading a little over eight bucks. And I said to him, I said, you know what? This is a good price. I'm going to sell the eight straddle. Mm -hmm. The eight straddle. So here, go to Groupon. For just, let me show you this. Up. So I go to Groupon yesterday afternoon. I'm just looking for trades. Because, you know, I've been watching it. It finally got over eight bucks. I'm thinking this eight straddle is kind of rich. I opened up July options. I looked at the eight straddle and I looked at the calls are 53 cents. The puts are 36 cents. I'm thinking, wow, you know, I, at the time I'm thinking I get this thing off for 90 cents. It's a pretty rich straddle at eight bucks. Sure. 90 cents straddle for 23 days. So I'm thinking to myself, okay, this looks good. So, but before I enter it, I go, you know, I'm just going to check with the, see where the volatility percentile is because, you know, I just, I'm selling premium here. And what does it say? Eight. Eight. Now, I know Groupon came from much lower numbers when it, the company was in turmoil, but then I just pulled in the reins. Right. Okay? Because I said, you know what? As as much as I like this straddle here, and it's got exa everything I want so about it. So now you have to make a directional trade if you're going to, That's right? right. You can't sell premium here. You're going to look to, I never entered the to order. buy a debit spread. You're I never entered the order. getting short Groupon. Got it. That's a perfect example for a Tasty Bites thing. I was I had my finger on the button. And I, just, you know, I said to myself, you know what? How come I'm not practicing what I preach? Mm -hmm. So I went back, looked at the 8%, and I said, you know what? Take it off the board. And that's just being mechanical. I'm not selling I'm not selling it in the 8th. Because it certainly has liquidity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I just I pulled it right off the board. So I'm, like, that's a perfect example. I was neutral on that trade. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I'm bullish. Sometimes I'm bearish. Sometimes I expect price reversion. But you know what? Price reversion is much more of like a, a pairs type or commodity trade than it, is really, than it really is. for We, we don't. Tony, and I don't think of price reversion to the mean very much when it comes to no. trading stocks. Um, I re IV reversion to the mean, absolutely. But you know, the problem for me is that IV reversion to the mean means do I sell them when they're high? Because I don't buy them when they're cheap. Correct. So I'm not going to buy this Groupon straddle. So so if it was high, I would sell it. If it's low, I'm just walking away. Okay. Good. And finally, a possible is it a possible pairs candidate? I mean, that's something we're going to look for today. We've got an open pairs trade on right now where we have S and P's versus Nasdaq um, on a five to three ratio. It was close to about unchanged yesterday, mm -hmm. but we'll look at some different stuff. I thought about a bonds pairs trade last night. Unfortunately, you know, it would have been it would have been okay. Not, nothing's well, bonds are right. up a point, so it would have been good. Right, you're looking to buy bonds. There yeah, I was looking to buy bonds on been... pairs trade. I was going to buy. I actually wanted to buy bonds and sell S and P's, and um, but I, you know. 
Whatever. We're going to cover some of that Bond S&P pair stuff today at the 9 o'clock hour. You're going to hear a little discussion about it. Bond's now. just a bigger product when they both move 1%, then you're yeah. going to make more money with the bonds. Um, I didn't talk – I talked about buying the bonds if they got down to the 133 and change level, which they did last night early, but they've never traded there since. On the sell side of bonds, at 135 um, – they're 135.09 right now. Mm -hmm. At the 136.02 level, I wrote it two days ago, somewhere around 136.02, one one. 3528 to 13602. That's a big area for them, that 136 area, and 136 and a half as well. So those are areas I'm not necessarily going to get short bonds, but I may sell some premium up there. Understood. Uh, if you're not getting a cherry bomb for some reason, just email support at and they'll set that all up for you. Let's go to the next slide. Is there one more, Linda? Perfect. Um, pick a strategy based on overall IV of the security. And the market. We only have a couple seconds here, so I got to mm -hmm. move quickly. Um, and hmm, let me just see something. Let me make sure. Okay, got two more, but I'm not sure. Yeah, I know two more after this. So I, so I was behind. Um, the overall pick a strategy based on the overall implied volatility of the security and the market itself. I mean, sometimes you know, if the implied volatility of the market is trading for X and the secure and and then let's say it's a hundred and the security is trading at seventy or mm -hmm. eighty, then you know what you're going to do the ETF. Right. Look for defined risk trades, and and you don't – defined risk trades is just a starting point. We're fine without defined risk trades. Believe me, we are. But with really small accounts, you just want to be careful that you have enough capital left over for strategic diversification. Mm -hmm. And then make sure you're capturing the right amount of premium. Let's go to the next one. Um, execution and strategy. We like to choose a price point for entry and exits and avoid chasing trades, which means we're looking for some price event. And we also may be looking, as I wrote the last thing, we're employing a profit or a date-based exit strategy. So profit meaning, hey, I've gotten to this percent relative to the date or the date being, hey, it's this date. It's late enough in the cycle. And of course, we always manage winners. We try to defend individual um, unlimited risk losers. But for the most part, rather than defending losers, we manage winners. And the key takeaway from here is employing a profit or date-based exit strategy. There's like, there's like this ratio, which we're going to talk about, of profit to number of days left. Let's right. go to the last, last slide. When trading a smaller size account, there are many hurdles to face. A well-defined and mechanical strategy is an important step to successfully facing these challenges, which just kind of a wrap-up slide. We'll archive all this stuff. There's a lot of great material in here. Um, we're at good health. we got the opening bell coming next. You're listening to Get Tasty on